welcome to the first few people coming in. I see Kay is about ready to be admitted, but um, I know some people are already watching and it is 11 o'clock. I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is we're on. I'll start the seminar almost like I do whenever I do home and garden shows. Let me talk for a few minutes as more people come and sit down virtually in the seminar. If you've got a question you want to ask of me, uh, you are starting off muted. And if you want to ask a question, you got to go to the chat comment area. And in the chat bar, you say, I have a question. And then uh, our moderator, Charles Geisler, uh, will let you in and let you ask your questions. We need to keep the questions short and sweet to the point. Uh, here's the bad news. I was thinking we could go to about 12, 10, 12, 15 today, but there has been one technical problem with the Zoom call. They were supposed to be able to run two seminars simultaneously, but the platform is only allowing them to do one at a time. So I have to finish right at 1155 and I'll do that. So again, as you get admitted in, uh, start thinking about your question and we'll get to those. I may talk about a couple of emails that are on this computer screen. So I'll be looking between here and the phone on the Zoom call uh, throughout this seminar. So welcome to my first ever See the white reflection in the picture. A um, couple of fun things just to mention real quick. If you see this, I'm wearing an EPBU shirt. If you are a personal Facebook fan of mine, you'll understand why I'm wearing this right now. Uh, my son plays tennis for them. He's a freshman. He's already in college. And they just posted their pictures, their team pictures. And he's uh, <laughs> sitting on, or he's standing there looking all serious in his picture. If you see my personal Facebook page, you'll see the proud papa moment. And so I decided I would wear this instead of a KTRH shirt for the first ever virtual seminar that we were doing. So it is fall, okay? Fall is for planting here in the Houston area, Southeast Texas. I, I know we are not officially in fall yet. That becomes fall equinox on September 22nd. But it doesn't mean we can't start plan, planning what we're gonna plant, whether it's gonna be a vegetable, a cold crop, we need to get the beds built right now, all right, so that we can start planting everything September 22nd moving forward. If it weren't so hot and we were, were going it back up into the 90s for hot temperatures again, then I would probably say get planting on a lot of these things. But if you've done nothing, we have to build the beds, first of all. Building the beds is so critically important when we're going to plant things. And October and November, actually the last week of September through all the way to the first week of December, considered the best two and a half months of planting time here in the Houston area. I didn't make that up. I've uh, researched that for years with the help of professional landscapers and professional planners and not just landscapers, but true good old fashioned gardeners. So when you can find plants and trees on sale and you prep the soil that way too, this is the, we're coming up on that time. It's, it's just golden to plant anything. Always remember fall, is for planting, especially here in Southeast Texas. Uh, one other thing I want to clarify, because uh, we see a lot of this on Facebook, I see a lot of this in emails where people are questioning it, they see advertising or promotions for certain products that might be on sale at certain nurseries and garden centers, and I get a little bit of pushback on some of this via email, especially on Facebook, going, I thought October was the time to start the fall schedule for lawn fertilization. And, and it really is, but we also, if you look at the schedule, you physically, let me show you some real quick. If you have a chance and you go to kthrh.com and click on uh, the garden line page, you'll see a printable schedule like this, all right? And if, if you look at it closely, it does show you the very end of September through pretty much the beginning of November. It's a big window. It's like a 45 day window to do the fall fertilization program. But we will promote the products that are on sale in nursery so you can get them in advance, right? I don't want you to just blow it off because uh, it's not time yet. Take advantage of the deals. These things will store for a couple of weeks, whether it's a fungicide, uh, whether it's the fall fertilizer, organic or synthetic, you're gonna start seeing a lot of promotion for stuff that we talk about. And don't let that 45 day window pigeonhole you to one specific week. It is a big window, right? And it does start in the last week of September. Well, really for all intents and purposes, the fall equinox moving to the first week of 
uh, well, first two weeks of November. I want to get it in before we get any kind of really cold spill coming through. Don't laugh. We'll, we, we got a freeze last uh, November, and right in the middle of November, if you'll remember, in 2019. So um, I don't want you to be uh, feel pigeonholed on certain days. Just because you see that ad doesn't mean go run out and buy it unless you want the deal on it, and then hey, hold on to it for a couple more weeks. If you follow us on Facebook, if you follow us via our weekly email tips, a lot of you are joining us because you may have read the weekly email tip we did Thursday promoting this seminar. Uh, virtual seminar, first ever for me. Yeah, that's so strange. And I know we got a lot of people online with us right now. And I will remind those that came in after I first started. I'm just going to read this. This is from our moderator, Charles. Uh, if you have a question, I will tell you when I'm going to open up for questions. You write in the chat line, I have a question. And then Charles will let us know who's going to be on, uh, unmuted for their question. And I say this one more time. We uh, kind of good news, bad news, good news is we're doing this. It's the first time we didn't know if it, uh, technically we we're going to have any problems. We don't. We're going to move forward. Bad news is we've got to shut down at 1155 because we can't overlap the, uh, the seminars. And the next person coming up has to have time to get in and get set up with our moderator, Charles Geisler. So a couple more things I want to talk about. And if I'm looking at the clock correctly, i got three more minutes of um, time. I said I would do some talking points. And then I will open it up for people that have questions because I know a lot of people are in the waiting room. A lot of people are already watching and hooked up with us. But so I mentioned fall is for planning. I mentioned the uh, fall fertilization schedule and not being tricked by the advertising that you see. You know, st stick, uh, stay with the one what brung you. Uh, dance with the one what brung you. And uh, just do what you've been doing if it's been working for you. This is a clarification on something that I've been promoting a lot lately. And, I was doing some vetting on it for a couple of months to make sure that it was something that felt good about. Um, I do an advertising campaign. Uh, I do, a, you know, basically I'm the spokesperson for a company called Sunday Lawn Fertilization. It is a, it's a startup company and about a year ago got started. And I, I thought it was a brilliant idea because there's a lot of people that don't ever use an entire bag of fertilizer because a big bag of fertilizer can cover anywhere from seven to 10,000 square feet. Uh, especially for the products that we recommend on Garden Line. And there's more and more people living in smaller homes with smaller yards, what we call a smaller footprint. Uh, very small, you know, 1,100, 1,500 square foot, 2,500 square foot of lawn. When, you know, the average lawn could be anywhere from 7,500 to 8,000 square feet if you take both, both the front and the back. This does not change the fertilization program. You're following my fertilization schedule. It doesn't change that at all. But for those people that have small footprints and those people that don't want to get out of the house, can't get out of the house, whether it be because of COVID-19 or not, I just need you to understand this is an alternative so you're not wasting fertilizer and it's a meal delivery service right to your front door. And real simple, the website is getsunday.com. They'll just ask for your address. Don't go there right now. Stay here with us on the seminar and we'll do that. So those are the three things I wanted to talk about. Look at that. I have one minute to spare. So that's one minute more to open up for questions. So I will open it up now. So if you do have a question, you want to do this virtually, maybe it's something for me to look at, but definitely talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Then ask Charles in the moderator form in the chat area. Say, I have a question. And then Charles will tell me who we're going to be talking to. While we get our very first uh, question up on the board, let me remind everybody that I got this. I, it's so funny I have this here. I'm not going to show it to you for one second. First email question, somebody sent in a picture of a wasp nest. It's like, I'm trying to be environmental. I don't want to kill Mother Nature's critters. And everybody else that's made in on it is basically, they kill them, do it. Well, we also talked about the red velvet ant on television this past week and on Facebook and our weekly email tips. And everybody wants to know how to kill those kind of wasps, whether it's the red velvet ant uh, or the cow killer wasp, as it's also known. The only thing you can use nowadays is good old fashioned wasp, hornet, yellow jacket killer. It'll say wasp and hornet on it for sure, sometimes yellow jacket. But that's how we kill wasps. You don't want the wasps being around to sting anybody. And they're going to be really aggressive right now. And if you've ever seen that cow killer wasp thing that we were talking about, you understand why you need a spray like that. So that's the answer, answer Paige's email. And by the way, I will go back to the email and check that out. But in the meantime, again, if you have a question, ask Charles right now in the chat line. So you say, I have a question, and then he'll allow you in. Got anything for me right now, Charlie? As of right now, uh, Julianne Bertag, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your names here. I'm not the best with, uh, with names. Uh, Bertain asked, are you taking questions from chat? So yes. if you want me to read these out loud? If you have a question, uh, Julianne, you can go ahead and ask it in the chat and I'll ask for you. 
Okay. And then another one from Carrie Lawrence. Let me go ahead and unmute you, Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so my question is about moths and the hundreds of moths that I have in my bushes. However, my bushes are blooming bushes that attract hummers and butterflies. So I don't want to harm them. So is there any suggestion for how to get rid of all the moths? You may not need to. Um, I know, obviously, when everybody asks, I got moths in the yard, we're talking about sod webworm. Just seeing moths does not automatically mean you have a problem, all right? So I wouldn't, if you don't see any damage in the shrub area, especially if you want to stay as organic as possible because of the pollinators uh, that you're trying to attract, you may not need to do anything. If you see a ton of moths in the yard, we have our extreme protocol for sod webworms, which includes the liquid bifenthrin you're probably thinking of. Um, and while it's, uh, it's going to kill the moths that you might spray, I'm not worried about bifenthrin's uh, residual for the pollinators. So you have my permission, perfectly fine to go out and spray uh, some of the shrubs, try to hit the moths while they're in midair, uh, take target practice on them. Uh, but you should not be hurting the pollination because this is not a systemic insecticide and it's not going to get into the bloom. Avoid the blooms at all possible times when you're spraying for the moths. But let's go back to the beginning. Just because you have moths doesn't mean you automatically have a problem. That same thing holds true for the moths in the yard. Ladies and gentlemen, if you go out there and you see moths, it doesn't automatically you have any infestation of solid webworm. You really have to get down and look for the worms that are doing the damage if you're going to do the extreme protocol treatment. Hope that helps. Well, uh, I, you, said, you asked about uh, Julianne Bertagne. Bertagne? I, I even have, I know her. <laughs> uh, I've done a consultation for her on site, but I also have pr trouble pronouncing her last name. But uh, yes, Julianne, we are taking questions. So if you get into the comment line, or the, what did you call it earlier? The chat line, say, I have a question, then Charles will put you on. So Charles, uh, Charlie, I know you like to be called, uh, but I'm being very formal today. Charles, whatever. Yes, I, I accept either one. <laughs> And by the way, it's Bertain, not Bertagne. Bertain is her last Bertain. name. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Julianne. She said, I'll just listen for the moment. It's pronounced Bertain, like champagne. Right. Got, got it. Thank you, Julianne. And by the way, uh, just small world story. I've done a consultation on site for her. This, and I've done one for one of her neighbors from years ago, a couple years ago, too. Uh, they live on the street that I used to go visit as about 10 year old, 11 year old kid all the time because my friend Wayne Britton used to live on that street. The house that Wayne lived in has been totally demolished thanks to Hurricane Harvey's floodwaters that happened pretty badly on that street in the Derry Ashford area. So, uh, Julianne, good morning. And anybody else over there in the old Derry Ashford area, good morning and welcome to our seminar. What's next, Charlie? Um, that is it from the chat window for the moment. Okay, then that lets me go back to the email questions. Anna Spears wrote in and wanted to actually uh, know what to do to get on this seminar. So I just answered her email and sent her to you. And basically, she, you have to go to uh, textwoodvirtual.com and get registered. And then once you do that, you'll see where you can get in. I don't know if there's any place else you need me to tell them. Charlie, you might be able to tell those that are straggling to get in here at the last minute if they're... Uh, if it's, if it's via email and I can answer it, what do I need to do besides textwithvirtual.com? Absolutely. So once you're in textwithvirtual.com and you're on the homepage, you'll see on the right side, there's an expert, feature, uh, expert speakers page. You click on that and that link will take you into the dates of the shows. There's September 12th and September 13th and then on demand. If they click on the date September 12th, they will see your presentation and a gallery of presentations at the time 11 o'clock. And I have the email up too. So those people that maybe just want to listen to me answering some of these emails, but maybe you want to throw your email or your question via the email, we can still answer it right here. Uh, just go to randy at ktrh.com. Uh, use that email directly for this next hour to answer your questions. Uh, I brought that up this morning and told everybody to go to randy at ktrh.com. And Travis did write in with a question. He goes, for your seminar, planted a bunch of trees and have been keeping them alive in the heat. Is there any need to fertilize or feed for the first fall or winter in the ground? That depends on how long it's been planted. I would not probably do a fertilization on a newly planted tree because if you plant it correctly and use the right soils and the right soil amendments, 
there's probably enough in that soil to work with for the first few months. If it's been more than three months and you've not done any feeding yet, yeah, I'd highly, I highly encourage an organic food, something like MicroLife 624 Green Label, anything that's a tree and shrub fertilizer. And if you don't care about whether you're organic or not, there are a half a dozen tree and shrub fertilizers on the market from companies like Nitrofloss and Nelson Plant Food, you name it. We can use anything organic or anything that's synthetic once the tree has been planted in the ground. So Travis, I hope that helped. But the best inside secret I can also give you, and it's kind of like when planting new grass, once you use your first, like, let's say micro organic fertilizer, water it in with the soil activators, some kind of liquid soil activator. You could use a liquid organic fertilizer for the feeding first time on a tree if it's organic. Anything organically driven is probably going to be the best for the first year of trying to deep root feed or feed the roots of a new planting section. Uh, and applause to applause to you, uh, Travis. You've been keeping them alive through this heat you're a rock star <laughs> because a lot of people have really been struggling. I also uh, got an email from a lady who already sent the pictures in and she's like, is it, are these worth saving? They were pine trees, pretty much 90%, if not more brown needles already. That is sure sign of death on the pine tree. I can't tell you what killed it. I don't know because I'm not there. Trees, if you want to save trees or you want to protect trees and you need to know and identify what's really going on with trees, it cannot be done just pictures online. You got to get a, a pair of professional eyes out there on that. And uh, let me get her name real quick because I still have Travis's email up. It was Susie. So Susie, on your email pictures, uh, is it worth having a, a tree company come take a look? Absolutely. If uh, they end up having to take the trees out, they'll waive the consultation fee in most cases. I know the company that I recommend, that's par for the course for them, and that's affordable tree service. And I'm going to give Susie that number here virtually, 713-699-2663. That's 713-699-2663. All right, Charlie, I'll leave it up to you. Is there even, and I'll tell everybody this one more time. If you want to ask the question live on the seminar, which I have no problem with, we can get as many questions as in until 1155. Go to the chat line and type in, I have a question, and then Charlie will unmute you and let you in for your question. Thank you so much, Randy. And we actually do have another question from uh, Sue Bradshaw, and she's in a loud area at the moment, and she doesn't wish to be unmuted to be distracting, but I'll go ahead and ask her question for her. Uh, she needs recommendations on bulk soil delivery for raised vegetable beds. It really depends on where you live. I'm not sure if she can respond to that quickly if you want to get back into the chat line area, Sue, but uh, it depends on where you live because we have several really good uh, providers of bulk soils and mulches from uh, Landscapers Pride, if you live way on the north side. Also, we have uh, Nature, Nature's Way Resources. You have the Warrens Southern Gardens Group because they have their Warrens heirloom soils. We have the Ground Up. It, it, for me, it just depends on where you live because I want to get you to the closest place possible. Uh, but for bulk delivery, we can get it from you know, Landscapers Pride, Nature's Way Resources, and the Ground Up. Yeah, she and, uh, uh, she's in the Bel Air area. Uh, I would get a hold of uh, the ground up, and that's going to be the closest one to you. And I tell her, go to www.thegroundup.com and uh, have a look at their rose and azalea soil, the seasons line of their rose and azalea soil. Another one uh, that they do, I'm blanking on the name right now because I don't have their information in front of me on the screen, but uh, any of their soils that they have blended are good. They, they deliver them in what I call super sac. They call super sac. And I love the Super Sac lineup of products because it is a product line whose time has come. We should have been doing this a long time ago to keep it neat and clean. And especially in the Bel Air area, I'm sure Homeowners Association probably not going to look fondly on you if you have, you know, a dump truck of soil and compost delivered on the driveway and the side. That's where the, the Super Sac idea comes in. So if you go to thegroundup.com and in the upper right hand part of the screen will be a link to the super sacks and it shows you all the different products that they carry at a soil yard like this and there's three of them in the Houston area so I'm going to guess that the one on um, Britain or I-10 would be the one they pull bulk from to get to the Bel Air area quicker. Uh, there are a lot of lots of soil yards around town. The majority of them their main product is, if their main product is dyed mulch I can't trust them right 
because dyed mulch is one of the worst things we can put on our soils around here. It kills the soil. It poisons the soil. And it doesn't look right. You ever seen a dyed mulch with fallen leaves? I was doing this to the neighbor. I was like, hey, you know, see that dyed mulch? All your little leaves that are falling off that creamer, the yellow leaves, they're standing out. <laughs> they stand out on that uh, dyed mulch. So that doesn't look good either. But you think about all that dye leaching into the soil over time, it's killing microbes. It's killing microorganisms. And anybody that says that the dye is organic, I, I don't care if it's organic driven dye. It's still made into a dye. That in and of itself is going to be caustic to the soil, and it's going to kill a lot of beneficials in the soil. And our job with mulches is to protect the soil, not harm it in any way. So I go back to my point. If you go to a soil yard and their main source of income is dyed mulch, turn around, you're in the wrong place. Charlie, what else you got? That is all the comments from the chat at the moment. All right, we're gonna go back to the, the, uh, the board of emails. Here we go. Uh, this is from Hugo, uh, who also, you, by the way, again, you can send me an email right now if you don't wanna go be heard in the Zoom call or you don't wanna go on air in the Zoom call for this seminar, but sayonara. Says, I went to go get uh, the bifenthrin for the uh, extreme protocol, which you think, and they were out of bifenthrin, so they gave me Sayonara. Sayonara is good, but not as good as bifenthrin, liquid bifenthrin, if you're doing the extreme protocol for sod webwork. I would use Sayonara kind of as a stopgap, but whenever they get the bifenthrin back in, I would jump back on that. I just know that it's on a scale of what works best? Bifenthrin is head and shoulders above almost any other. But there's other people. We had a call this morning on the radio show to kind of prove that. A gentleman called about his uh, dog, right? He had a new puppy. And he really needed to get rid of the side of wetworms, but he was worried about the bifenthrin for the puppy. Look, the liquid bifenthrin is not going to be a problem for dogs at all. I don't believe that the granular bifenthrin is a problem for adult dogs and bigger dogs. So puppies, small dogs, definitely keep them off that section for at least two days if you're going to do the granular bifenthrin because you don't want it to get on the pads so they try to lick that off but it's usually not toxic to the pets so we kind of like take that with a little grain of salt and try to buffer it so i would use a liquid permethrin a liquid permethrin or permethrin and so on that scale bifenthrin being the toughest then cyanaro in the lambda psi lutheran category be here well, the liquid permethrins are not going to be near as strong, but they're definitely not nearly toxic to animals either on that scale. So uh, it's kind of you have to mix and match when you're worried about the pets. All right, Charlie, uh, you know, I keep seeing these things pop in, people coming in late. So let me kind of reintroduce. I've seen about four or five different people, uh, I say people, but the information them being allowed in or let in or just requesting to come in. So this first ever uh, Randy Lemon Garden Line seminar we're going to do for this virtual home and garden show. Uh, I applaud the, the Texwood group and uh, Tony Woods for uh, at least trying to give us some kind of home and garden show, be it virtually, because of COVID-19. And since I love doing home and garden shows, I've been doing it for Tony. Gosh, I don't know, wish Tony was here right now. He could answer that question. It seems like it's been over 15 years. Started with the Woodlands Home and Garden Show. And the first ever uh, Montgomery County that I ever did was this past spring. We got that in before the COVID-19 shut us down. And that was a great home and garden show. And I had a great time talking to the crowd and then going back to our booth and you know, signing books. Can't do the books right now, but don't worry about that. We're going to relaunch the book in 2021 anyway, uh, because of what happened this spring due to the Rona, as we like to call it around the offices uh, at KTRH and iHeartMedia. So uh, since I love doing home and garden shows, I, you know, I jumped all over the opportunity to do this seminar for him. And it was, it's no different than what we've always done. We're going to be limited on time, just like we were you know, when we do the seminars on site, whether it be like the Sci Fair Home and Garden Show, Woodlands Home and Garden Show. There's someone that comes in after me to do a seminar. We tried to do it, uh, set it up in such a way that we could overlap and have two different platforms for it. So you guys could uh, keep asking questions all the way through to about 12, 15. But unfortunately, that platform didn't get worked out well enough. And so we're going to be limited. 11.55, we're going to shut it down. So in the meantime, ask your questions when you go, hey, there we go. Tony's uh, writing in right now. We started in 2003. Are you kidding me? 17 years. I said 15. Boy, was I off. So since 2003, I love doing uh, the Woodlands Home and Garden Show. 
but that's now been changed to what we consider the Montgomery uh, County Home and Garden Show. Still love doing Sci Fair, love doing Sugarland. Uh, I'm sure there's going to be other home and garden shows in our future as long as I keep doing Garden Line. And I don't believe I'm going anywhere anytime real soon. So uh, uh, we'll do these again in the future in person. But in the meantime, use this platform to ask your question in person. Maybe if you couldn't get it on the air today on the radio show. We'll do the radio show again tomorrow morning, just like normal, 6 to 10. And if you want to hold on to your question until we do Sunday seminar again at 11 a.m., feel free to do that. But in the meantime, in the chat line, ask Charlie for your question. He can either put you on the air. We can do it Zoom style, or just like uh, Tony did, uh, he basically did it in his own chat line. Uh, Charlie can forward me that, and I can see your question. And I'm, I'm weaving, as you can see, I keep looking down here at the emails as they keep popping in as well. And if you have something for me to look at, send it via email right now, randy at ktrh.com, and we can pop those pictures up. Worked out great for Susie. And uh, Anna and Travis, we were able to answer those three questions, two of those three questions. I had pictures that went along with it. So I'm not sure if you have something for me to look at, but if you do, feel free to send it right now via the email, randy at ktrh.com. I give it back to you, Charlie. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you're just now tuning in, Charlie Geisler, he's our uh, moderator to keep us going and may let us know when there are questions, because it would sound horrible. If you've ever done a Zoom call before, it's, and everybody's talking at the same time. It's not a pleasant, not a pleasant sight or no, sound for the ear. So uh, absolutely just let Charlie know if you have a question in the chat line and he'll either put you on or he'll ask the question for you. What do you got for me now, Charlie? Oh, question about lizards. All right. What, what is the question? I'm sorry, question about lizards. Um, that is a great question. Carrie, do you have, uh, can you expound a little bit on your question about lizards? If you don't like lizards, shame on you. Lizards are great for eating mosquitoes and other bad insects. Uh, I have this issue on a personal level. I love the lizards and the geckos around my property because I know they're doing good things. But I also have a wife and a daughter, <laughs> and they don't like the lizards at all. And because of that, um, they, you, you want control. So Whenever I feel like there's a little overpopulation of lizards that you don't want in a landscape, then I, and I, the way I control it is actually organically. I get cedar oil and I get citronella oil. And one week I'll spray the uh, cedar oil and the next week I'll spray the citronella oil. And the use of those are the kind that you hook on the end of the hose, they're already ready to spray, just flip the switch, right? And they will take really good care of you. And it, it won't kill the lizards, but it'll keep them from entering the area. So that's something I have to do. There are also uh, cedar granules, if you want to put those in a landscape bed that might be up near the house where you think they're coming from, cedar granules will work. But when it comes to citronella, it's only the citronella oil in the spray that works well. And oh, by the way, speaking of citronella plants that the oils come from, I know a lot of people, I, at least once a year, I'll get a question on gardening, whether it be, be email or whether it be somebody needs to mute their call right now. If you've unmuted your phone, you've got a little feedback coming, so mute your call. If you have a question, ask in the chat line. Charlie will ask it for you or put you on individually. All right, so back to the point about citronella. Uh, I get a lot of questions about I need some plants that I can plant that will keep the mosquitoes away naturally. It, that's a misnomer. Just planting citronella plants doesn't necessarily keep the mosquitoes away. If you go by and brush the plant, the oil's release. If you crush some leaves, the oil's release. That's what will keep the mosquitoes and other insects from the area. But just planting a citronella plant, that's not how you keep mosquitoes out. You actually have to release the oil. So it's kind of a misnomer on that. Doesn't mean don't plant the citronella plants, but if you really want them to be the active uh, barrier, then you gotta go by and crush some leaves and brush some leaves. All right, so Carrie wrote back, lizard question, I don't, do not have anything against lizards. I'm now seeing many, many ones. I got. I don't know. You may have to ask that question, Charlie. It didn't stay up there long enough for me to read. Yes. Uh, so Carrie just commented again. I had her unmuted. I think that's where the feedback might have been coming from. Um, she says, "I don't have anything against lizards. I am now seeing many, many brown lizards, not the traditional green lizards. There are babies all over the place when I walk outside, and lizards scurry into the bushes." Yeah, that's, uh, I'm not going to give you anything more than I already did because I'm not going to want you to spray chemicals for the area. 
But if you are seeing brown lizards, be very proactive with the cedar, cedar oil, cedar granules, and the citronella oils. Um, Sometimes garlic oils work too, if you can handle the smell of garlic, and I should tell you that. But there's a lot of essential oil-based uh, natural barriers that the lizards hopefully will leave because of that. But yeah, we have a problem. The brown lizards aren't as good as the green lizards, I know that. But it's still not the worst thing to happen. Right? Uh, they, everybody has their kind of likes and dislikes on the lizards area. Right now, unless you see damage happening from the brown lizards, I'm going to just be a natural protocol against them, just like the green lizards, if you don't like them. For me, I, I love it when I see geckos, because I know good things are happening in pest control. And I know when I see green lizards, good things are happening when it comes to natural pest control. All right, Charlie. All right, we had a question from Tracy Garcia. She asked it in the chat, but I'm gonna go ahead and let you unmute yourself if you'd like to ask directly. Hi, Randy. Um, I just started. I'm on day 10 of the extreme protocol, and I'm wondering after the 14 days, how do I know it's working? Well, actually, the extreme protocol calls for three weeks. <laughs> so you're looking at 21 days if you're really going to do this completely. Um, I don't know if you were listening to the very beginning. Uh, one of our very first questions had to do with moths. And just in general, just because you see moths, Tracy, do not panic, okay? Don't, don't think, and it's not working. That's happened so much lately. What I'll tell people to do is to make sure you know that it's working. Don't base it on moths, you see. Base it on getting down on your hands and knees. Let's look into the grass and look for the worms. If you still see worms, you just gotta keep up with the protocol for up to three weeks. Because every couple of days we're doing something, either the liquid bifenthrin or, and then the BT. And if you want to alternate between bifenthrin and cyanara, bifenthrin and malathion, you know, if you want to alternate the liquid control, I have no problem with that because that's actually a good thing so that the insects don't get used to one over the other. They can come, become resistant to one in some cases. So mix and match if you need to, but let's look. Don't base everything on just moths on top of the ground. Charlie, you got another one? All right, that looks like it for the moment. The last question was about, oh, hold on, someone just came through. Okay, this is from uh, Carrie Lawrence again. And is, is treatment for sod worms going to kill the earthworms? Yes, can't get around that. So there's no way of getting around that. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't get them back. Once we get rid of the sod worms, uh, this came up again today on the radio program in a couple instances. and. I actually got a couple of really fun, nice comments, uh, kudos type comments about how good compost top dressing, aeration and compost top dressing work. When we go to fix the damaged areas of the sod webworms, think compost top dressing. The more compost top dressing you do, and if you've never done it, we always recommend it once every six, month, six months for a couple of years, right? So if you're doing that once every six months for a couple of years, all that organic matter is going back into the soil. That's what will attract the earthworms again we got to give up on the earthworms for a little while while we're doing stuff like the extreme protocol. So hopefully that helps. Um, I, it's just, this is crazy for me. You don't get to see what I see, but I get to see when people have entered the room and uh, I see when questions are getting popped up on the screen. Uh, I don't, I see myself in the bottom corner of the screen I'm looking at, but uh, don't get to see all the, all of you on there. I know there's a lot in watching and listening right now on this zoom call. And by the way, thank you. Uh, thanks for making this uh, a semi-solid uh, success. We didn't know how many people we get, and we're 30 minutes into this, not even, even uh, halfway, well, just over halfway done with it because we do have to shut down at 1155. If they, and I, if you don't mind me selling this, Charlie, if we can get this uh, overlapping uh, application to happen tomorrow, we can go a little bit longer and we can get more people in with more questions. So then, uh, Mary, uh, let me do a, uh, Mary's question real quick here. And let me get back to it. I saw Mary pop up on this. I know she sent it from, the, okay. Um, what She sent me a picture. Can you identify this? I wish I could show you the picture, but if I tried to move the camera, right, and this is our first uh, virtual seminar we've ever done. Uh, eventually, we'll be able to figure out how to pop other pictures up on the screen. But uh, she sent a picture of Katie Ruelia. If you know anything about Mexican petunias, right, Mexican petunias, uh, are, are really solid. I have a huge batch in my landscape. 
And by the way, can you figure out I am broadcasting from my own office in here? Uh, that's this is where I do my radio show uh, from nowadays, thanks to the coronavirus too. But in the landscape, I'm pointing out that one uh, in the south of our pool, I have a ton of Mexican uh, petunia type things, and and basically the Katie Realia was a dwarf version of the Mexican petunia. So it's kind of a cool plant. And she didn't know if it was a weed and she wanted to get rid of it, but it's in the middle of her bird of paradise. I say keep it. Just make sure you pull weeds out when you do see it, but keep the Katie Realia. So hopefully that'll help. Uh, and I'm trying to remember. Yeah, that wasn't Mary. My bad. Uh, let's see. What was the name? There was no name. That's why. There's a Mary for... Ann who's asking a question in the chat. Uh, go ahead and uh, unmuting her. Okay. Is that, the, is that the Mary you're referring to? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. This is R-K-E-C-P-5 in the Katie Ruelia thing. And it's a cool flower. Uh, just look it up. Katie Ruelia is spelled R-U-E-L-L-I-A. So go ahead with the next question you said from, was it from Margie? Uh, it was from Marianne. So I went ahead and asked to uh, unmute, but I haven't gotten her in yet. So I'm guessing she might not would, uh, want to. So let's just ask the question. Can I plant uh, plum, plumagos at this time of year? <laughs> Plumbago. Plumbagos. <laughs> yeah. Actually, blue plumbago, one of my favorite plants of all time for Southeast Texas landscapes. If you have a pool, you'll want blue plumbago. If you have, if you want to mix colors, it's the most beautiful light blue flowering plant that we can plant, but blue plumbago, P-L-U-M-B-A-G-O. Everybody should have it. It's kind of like a top 10 plant we could have in our landscape. So easy to care for. Even if we do get hard freezes and they may singe back, they always come back from the root system. It's impervious. It is uh, Texas tough. Uh, I've written about it as a Texas tough perennial. It is a Texas, I think it's a Texas native. Not 100% sure on that, but it's something that anybody that's landscaping in Southeast Texas should have. And I guess point to her, more to her question, you can and should plant it at this time of the year. What we consider October, November, so we're a couple of weeks away from it. I like to say end of September all the way through the first of December, considered about the two and a half best months to do transplant work, redo landscape bed. Uh, your plants that you might get from a nursery or even a wholesale nursery may not be perfect specimens right now like they are in the spring. That's okay. You get them for usually a fraction of the cost at this time of the year. Everybody's always having sales. And so get them while they're on sale and then kind of just groom them back once you get them planted. But if you do the beds right, it will reward you uh, by establishing a root system solidly for the winter. And then when we're done with winter and spring pops its head out quickly, the well-rooted plants will reward you by becoming full and full of blooms and just full of growth the very first part of spring, as opposed to waiting till spring to do the transplant work. Our ground never freezes here. Because right? our ground never freezes, we should be landscaping more and more into September, all of October, most all of November, and sometimes, depending on the weather patterns, through the first week of December. That's a big opportunity. We're talking, you know, 60, 60 what, 60 plus 14, what would that be? 74, 75 days of opportunity to get landscape work done. So really good question. All right, Charlie, I'll leave it up to you. Uh, yes, I just got a notification from uh, one of our social media people that people are asking questions in the Textwood virtual site chat window, but I'm have to ask you to uh, go into the Zoom chat window to ask the questions. Uh, Margie said that there's a lot of people that have questions for us, so if you just go ahead and go back into your Zoom window and click the chat button in there, enter it into the chat from here, and I'll be sure to ask them to Randy for you. Uh, is there anywhere I can go to go look at those questions real quick? Um, Let's see. I'll, I'll just type in textwithvirtual.com. I'm not sure that's going to help, but if you tell me where to go after that, I can also see that. And I got, we got you all the way till 11:55. Uh, uh, I know we're going to have to shut down to give the next speaker time to get hooked up with Charlie, the moderator for this Zoom call. But in the meantime, I'll let you. I will go back to the emails if you need me to, unless you've got a question popping up since then. Um, let's go back. Let's see. Uh, you can see look down here. That's the last question for the moment. Let's go back to the emails, then we'll circle back to the chat. Okay. So my next question was from Tracy, and it had to do with uh, Vitek. Um, do you recommend this tree? She probably saw one in bloom this year and probably fell in love with it like everybody does. I love Vitex. All right. Vitex 
is a much better alternative than any crate row. Now, granted, you really only have two colors. You have the purple blue bloom and there's a white Vitex. But in place and instead of the crate myrtle, the Vitex is impervious. It's another one of those plants that I highly recommend. I've written about it for years. I have one, two, four. I planted my fourth one recently, my property up in Rose Hill, Texas. That's how much I like it. And uh, if you want to know how to feed the, the uh, Vitex, now Tracy's question did not ask about feeding it, but the, the fun part is you can feed it crate myrtle food and you can feed it rose food. You can feed it anything that's a blooming plant food type. Uh, I know a lot of people make fun of me for recommending uh, Nelson Color Star for just about everything, but that's a good example. You want any kind of slow release or controlled release blooming plant food for the Vitex. Now, my advice is if you do have a Vitex, maybe a little late in the season now, but if you do have a Vitex, always when you go through the first bloom cycle, prune off all the blooms, feed it something like Color Star or any blooming plant food, and you will get a whole other round of Vitex blooms. My, uh, my newly planted one, uh, once it went through its first bloom, man, I immediately trimmed off all those that at Color Star, and it's in full bloom right now. Yeah, it's a baby. It's only about six foot tall compared to the others. But you want a greater alternative, Tracy, I highly recommend the Vitex. I know when people see it for the first time, they fall in love with it. Charlie, I'll leave it up to you. All right. Um, that if is you don't have, let me know. Much. I'm sorry? If you don't have any questions on that chat line, let me know. Yeah, there's no further questions right there. The last one that came in was the plumbago. Plumbago. We're going to teach you how to pronounce it. Plumbago. plumbago. I got to get this one right. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, you're going to be a garden line expert by the time these two seminars are over today and I tomorrow. So. All right, so uh, this was from Roxanne. Uh, so Roxanne was asking about the compost top dressing and where she could get it by the back. Oh my goodness, Roxanne everywhere. Uh, yeah, we allu uh, alluded to it earlier in this seminar and definitely talked about it. I had two calls today that were like giving us kudos for aeration and compost top dressing. And that you know makes you day as the garden advice giver when people call in uh, to give you the kudos for the advice that you gave them months ago or weeks ago, and it really does work. My point this morning, Roxanne, was to just have a couple of bags on hand at any given time. And uh, depending on where you are, and you're on the north side of town, you're up 45 apparently. So very easy for you to either just go to uh, Nature's Way Resources and get the, the leaf mold compost, get the finely screened leaf mold compost. If um, you are, end up at a garden center, nursery garden center, find out if they have vegetative compost or leaf mold compost. Those are the two we use for top dressing the yard. There are some animal composts by the bag but if they're too chunky sometimes or too thick to put out in a uh, top dressing fashion, that's why I love the double screen, the finely screened ones. It looks like dirt, but it is compost. And you have Nature's Way makes it, the ground up makes it by the back. Nature's Way makes it by the back. If I'm missing anything right now, Paulo, you know, Nature's Creation uh, can be found at a lot of retail garden centers. But these are all really good compost by the back that we can use to repair things. How many times over a period of a year will I get pictures from people that have just damaged area? Maybe this big, maybe you know, no bigger than a couple of feet. When you break out brown grass, you open that dirt up to lay the compost right there. And when you do that, you're healing the soil and it will fix itself over time. And that was the compliment we got two times today. It's like people that took that idea, took that protocol from advice they got on the radio show earlier in the year were coming back at me saying, Boy, I didn't believe it when I first did it, but boy, did it fix the area. And that's the beauty of uh, compost. So for Roxana, I think it's Roxana, not Roxana, sorry. It is definitely worth getting bags and keeping it on the standby so you can do repair work. I wouldn't keep the in the bag in your storage for longer than any six months. It needs to be used while it's fresh. That, that biological activity, you don't want to burn it off by leaving a plastic bag of compost out in the sun for days on end. Hopefully that makes sense. Charlie, I, I, that was my last email question I just got in. I'm not sure what you've got. Excellent. I actually have two more questions. Uh, the first one right now is from uh, Jenny Taylor. Uh, Jenny, I'm going to go ahead and ask to unmute you if you want to ask your question. Hi, Randy. Can you hear me? 
Uh, how do you get rid of uh, the Japanese clover? I don't know how to say an L E S P D Z A. Okay, you have to start out because it is. It sounds very like you're talking in a tin can sort of thing. Tell me what it is you were asking about again. Spill it slowly for me. Uh, yes, so it was the, uh, she asked the Lesbadeza or Japanese clover, L-E-S-P-E-D-E-Z-A, or Japanese clover. If you can unmute her, where is this? Is it in bed? Is it just in the lawn? What are you, talk, what are you talking about? It's in my lawn. Okay. We try to treat it like we're treating things such as Virginia buttonweed right now, uh, doveweed those kind of things. We need a kind of specific herbicide. The one that comes to mind right off the bat while we're still warm, is a product called Top Shot. I can't tell you exactly where to get it. I know that it comes out of the Nitrofoss warehouse and it's actually made by a semi-local company, uh, Control Solutions. They took over the Top Shot brand. And so you should be able to find it here. But if you follow instructions, that should work on the Lespedeza uh, in the lawn. Now, if it's in the if you can pull out what you can for the meantime in the next 30 days, I still lump that that control into the best way to control is with the cool season herbicides. And ladies and gentlemen, we're nowhere near the use of cool season herbicides. I need the high temperatures to not exceed 80, 81 degrees, uh, 82 mainly, but uh, I need our low temperatures to be in the 60s and then moving lower than that. Cool season herbicide controls a lot from Virginia buttonweed to dove weeds in this case, Lespedeza, um, the bush clover, I think. But if you want to try one more product, you can't find the top shot, then like Bonide weed beater for southern lawns. It has to be for southern lawns. Make sure you add a surfactant. Give that a test run. Charlie? All right. Uh, well, that's all the questions in our chat, but I actually have a question for you myself. All right. So we have uh, a tangerine tree and a lemon tree. And um, we've had these trees and they've been planted. We planted them from nursery stage and they have not gotten much taller than just about four feet off the ground in the last 10 years. Uh, okay. I think it's because a lot of clay that's in our backyard. So you gotta what, plant them as if you're um, planting a tree and then making a raised bed for vegetables at the same time. We marry those two concepts. And so if you don't create perfect drainage and a little slightly raised soil, for citrus trees, they're gonna get stuck in a clay bowl that they are planted in. So obviously that many years ago, you probably knew nothing about garden line, much less any gardening in general when you first home, your first fruit trees. It is fair game to get out there and do what I call an intense deep root feeding of these trees. Cause if they've been there for 10 years, the last thing you wanna do is rip them out of the ground and reset them. So we're going to amend the soil around, we're, a drip line of a tree, so you have the canopy of a tree, the drip line inside and outside of the drip line, we're going to auger hole with a soil auger. Now, it usually goes down anywhere from 14 to 18 inches. I just need you to get the smallest soil auger you possibly can, three quarter of an inch maybe, maybe no more bigger than one inch. And we're going to do holes inside and outside that drip line all the way around that tree. And then you're going to feed it an organic citrus food. Microlife 624 orange label. Um, if you don't care if it's organic, then you have the Nelson plant food type products. You have Nelson citrus food. You can use Color Star as a stop cap, but let's get this thing fed. Every time you put food down, you're supposed to feed them up to four times a year. So if we do it right after the pruning, all right, you, by the way, sneak in a feeding right now after the deep root augering and holes. Right. Then we're going to start the four times a year feeding right after we do the pruning, ready? So normally into February 1st of March is the pruning fruit trees around here. And then the augering of the holes after that. I'm watching the clock too, by the way. So we're going to do one right then, March, May, July, and then try to get your last one in, very last feeding in, at least by October 1st. Usually by September is the best time. And as we water those in with soil activator, that's going, all this over a period of the next year is going to improve that soil. The more you improve that soil, the more organically enriched that soil becomes the more the root systems will establish further beyond that clay hole, and that's when you start getting the active growth. Gotcha, that's what I need. All right, thank you so much. And uh, we do have another question that came in through the chat. Uh, this one again is gonna be Jenny Taylor. So Jenny, I'm gonna go ahead and ask to unmute you. All right, 
Jenny? Uh huh. Do you have a favorite like coloring bedding plant for the far bed? Well, for favorite coloring bedding plant? God, we don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> How about your top three? Uh, I, I will answer that with one name, really. It is still my favorite. It's what I've used for years. I got introduced to it probably at 16, 17 years ago by the Arbor Gate. It has been profiled heavily in my books, the last two books. It's called Angelonia. Angelonia comes in about four different colors. You have a purple, almost a deep purple too, a blue, a very light blue, a white, and a pink. So there's a wide range of colors, but if you can get a mix of those blooms going in one pot, by a front door, it's great. I love it as a, a what I call color pockets. I, I don't ever do an, like 50 feet of a flower. I want concentrated areas of flower, I call them color pockets, and kind of put those strategically in flower beds. And when it comes to number one perennial that can bloom pretty much year round for us, it has to be the Angelonia. But if you ever get a chance, uh, and I'll do a lot more promotion on this on my radio show and in email tips and Facebook posts about my new book. Uh, it's called New Decade Gardening, but we kind of put it on the back burner because of COVID-19, because of the coronavirus. We couldn't get out and do book signings, which is a, the best way to get it introduced to everybody. I never have sold my books online. It's always at the retail garden centers, the Ace Hardware stores, and the feed stores. They carry all the products that we do promotions for and do endorsements for. Uh, and these nurseries and garden centers have the book right now, but um, we can't do any book signings. So we just kind of put it on the back burner. When it gets close to Christmas time, we're gonna do some events with the book, but you can look for it today. Oh, you know, I should have probably, uh, yeah, look at that. New Decade Gardening, the Gold Coast Guide, keep it from being flashy right there. Um, we're gonna do, just keep your eyes for this at Nurseries Garden Center, Ace Hardware Stores, and Feed Stores in the region. And I'm definitely gonna be doing some stuff with it for Christmas gift giving ideas but we're gonna rebirth it from a distribution standpoint in early 2021 uh, because it just didn't, it was not a priority after we all kind of right, got shut down, and stayed home and didn't do any garden line appearances and obviously couldn't do these seminars in, in public places with mass numbers. I have time for one more question, Charlie, if you have one. I do, I have one more. This one came in from Anna Estrada from Laporte, Texas. She says, I have a 10 by 10 vegetable bed and my okra is very tall. Can I still plant a fall garden? Well, I mean, <laughs> you only need a couple of okra in a 10 by 10 to have enough of a crop if it's still producing for you, absolutely. Let's say for the sake of argument, you had like four, you know, take two of them out, right? And yes, uh, re-amend that soil where you wanna do your fall vegetables. Uh, we are not, close to what I call coal, C-O-L-E, coal crop planting season yet. I usually wait till October for that. So we got a whole month till that, but peppers, early tomatoes, uh, some uh, summer squash, definitely get those started ASAP, but let's re-amend the soil where we're extracting at least two of the four okra plants. Now, uh, I will tell you this, since we're down to like one minute, got to get out of here for the next uh, seminar. We're going to do this again tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. So be here early. Um, get in early and let's do as many questions as we possibly can. I'm pleased that we got as many questions as we did. I'm glad we were able to weave in the emails. And if uh, anybody wants to know this picture behind me, that is Kyle Field. That was way before uh, the uh, when they did the red, white, and blue after 9-11. But that's just an old picture I've had for a gazillion years out there. I saw that come through email. What's that picture behind you? And that is Kyle Field from many, many years ago when I was a student there. Uh, and of course, that's one of my degrees <laughs> from a and &M. And last but not least, here's what the book looks like one more time. So if you're gonna get out and look for it today, uh, Newton Decade Gardening, we'll do a whole lot more with that around Christmas time. Thanks for everything that you uh, are doing for us out there, Charlie. Uh, for those of us seminar givers, I really appreciate it. It's fun talking with you. I had a great time talking to you off the air too. Good guy, Charlie Geisler. Thank you, thank you, Tony Woods. And we're gonna do this again tomorrow morning.